This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so before we start, uh, let me just uh, warn you of the fact that we forgot to record <laughs> the previous lecture, but uh, there will be lecture notes that I will upload uh, to our uh, ENS folder, so uh, at least the material uh, will be there available for uh, everybody to read. And I saw that there are some questions on both homeworks and lecture notes in the question and answer files, and I will go through them uh, between today and tomorrow. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, that will also be addressed uh, very soon. Okay, and now let's come to uh, the uh, topics of the uh, today of today, which is related to this problem of uh, optimal control that was discussed uh, in the last lecture. So uh, what we're gonna do is uh, go through this, this exercise. So we will do uh, the main part and then there are some calculations that I will leave uh, to do as an exercise. And if there is time, I will go back to, uh, to the final part of uh, today number three, uh, just to discuss a little bit how to solve uh, for the stationary state of uh, pocket Planck equations for uh, multiplicative noise. So that's uh, quite an easy thing, but it's good to see it. Uh, at least once uh, at the blackboard. Okay, but uh, before let's start with uh, with the today. So I hope that uh, everybody has uh, the text uh, that I just sent uh, via email. And uh, the idea is to discuss uh, a simple application of this uh, hamilton jacobi bellman equation. And uh, the problem that we have in mind in here is, uh, you can think of it as a problem of uh, optimal liquidation, uh, which means that there is uh, somebody, so some agent, that has, for instance, at time zero, a given amount uh, Q0 of some uh, tradable instrument, as we call it here. So this can be whatever. You can even think about uh, some stocks uh, that you have at time t equal to zero. And you would like to sell all of this uh, quantity of, uh, of stocks or of this instrument. And you want to do it before a given final time t. So this is the, the finite time horizon. And uh, the question is, what is the optimal way to do this? So what is the speed at which uh, you should sell? Should you try to sell everything uh, very fast at the beginning? Or should you uh, somehow have a strategy that is more flat over this time interval? Or, uh, or, or let's say in general, what is the best way to do this? And uh, we will try to uh, discuss two frameworks. So the first part is about uh, let's say one single agent that uh, has to face this uh, optimization problem. And the second part is uh, about, uh, so in the second part, we will introduce some interactions that we will treat uh, at the mutual level. So the idea is that you have one agent that wants to sell its quantity of uh, its amount of this, uh, of these stocks, let's say, uh, but he or she is not alone. And there are many others with whom uh, there is some interaction. Okay, so let's start with uh, with part one. And let me summarize a little bit uh, what are the uh, quantities. Uh, uh, let me first, uh, let me um, tell you that uh, the way we will treat this problem with interaction uh, falls within the framework of the so-called mean field games. And there is some reference uh, in the text of the today that you may look at if you're interested into this uh, subject of mean field games. Okay, but first, uh, let's start with a, with a single agent. And the uh, idea of the model is as follows. So there are some random variables which describe the state of your systems that I will encode into a vector y, which depends on time. And these random variables are uh, q, uh, depending on time, are some x of t and some s of t. So this Q is uh, the amount of uh, instrument that you want to sell uh, in this finite time uh, interval. So we call it the inventory at time t. Uh, X is uh, essentially the amount of money that you make uh, out of this selling. So I will call it uh, the wealth, just to, uh, just to have a name for it. Uh, and S is a variable which does not describe directly the state of the agent, but if you want, it describes uh, the state of, uh, of the market in some sense. So this is the price associated to, uh, to the object uh, that uh, the agent wants to sell. 
And of course, these quantities are uh, dynamical quantities, so they satisfy certain equation of motion in time. So in particular, Q of T will vary uh, over time because, of course, it will decrease whenever you are selling uh, this quantity. And it will decrease proportionally to some uh, velocity that I call VT. And the velocity is precisely the control. So it is the function of time that uh, you, uh, on which you have some power. So you can choose how fast you want to sell uh, this quantity over time. So let me call it, as we did in the lecture, uh, the control. Uh, so you see that uh, when you're selling, this quantity is diminishing, and so your velocity is, uh, is negative in, in this definition. Then how much money uh, do you make uh, in an interval dt by selling this quantity? Well, this, is, this has to be proportional to uh, minus vt times uh, what, what you would put in here a priori would be somehow the price of, uh, of the quantity that you are selling uh, that, uh, that is given by s of t. Uh, but then the idea is that uh, when you do this type of uh, financial operation, let's say there is also a cost which is associated to the fact that you are selling or, uh, or buying. And in the model that we will consider today, the cost, uh, we will take it to be uh, simply proportional to the velocity at which you are selling uh, these quantities. So I will introduce in here an additional factor of k times uh, the velocity. And this is telling you that uh, essentially when you are selling, so this velocity is negative, the, the effective price at which uh, you sell your, your good is, uh, is, is, let's say, the price of the good itself minus the cost associated to the operation, which is, uh, which is given by this KVT. And then you have an equation for the third uh, dynamical variable in here, which is the price. And, uh, and this will be given by some quantity that I call mu of t. And uh, this function mu is, uh, is where the interaction will enter when we will discuss it uh, in, in part two. But for the moment, uh, let me write it generically like this. Plus, what we can do is to add uh, some noise, so some volatility that tells you that there are fluctuations uh, in the price that are due to, uh, to different reasons and that you encode uh, generically into, uh, into some noise term. So just to give you some uh, terminology, this uh, quantity in here that decreases uh, the price is uh, often called in this literature market price. And uh, this quantity here, which controls how uh, the price is varying with respect to the, to, to, let's say, uh, some external input which may contain uh, also the state of, uh, of other agents is what is usually called, so let me try to put the narrow like this, uh, is called market impact. Um, can you put up the blackboard a little bit because it's out of the... Yes, sure. This way. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Okay, that's good. Okay, so this is what we are going to discuss in part one. Now, let me just uh, mention what sh shall one do uh, to generalize this to the case of uh, many agents. So I will be a little bit sloppy in here, but let's say that the idea is that if you have many agents, you can label them with some index uh, A. So you will have one of these state vectors. So Y of T, we go to some y of t labeled by uh, a and a identifies uh, each of your agents so let me assume that they go from one to n and uh, the uh, interaction between them as i said will enter through this uh, quantity mu uh, in here and uh, what uh, we are going to consider in the following is uh, the case in the in which the mu uh, let's say that enters into the equations for the agent uh, a is the average of uh, the velocities of all of the other agents uh, in, the, in, in the market, let's say. So I will think about something like this. This will be one, some one over n, some over all other agents of their velocity. And uh, what we will, go, uh, we will do in part two is to go to some sort of continuous limit 
and replace, let's say, this average with, uh, with a continuous average, but I will comment uh, more about this uh, in the following. Okay, so to conclude uh, the introduction uh, to the model, what I have to do is to specify the uh, objective function or the cost function, uh, which is actually a functional which depends on uh, all of the trajectory over time of uh, this vector y. So let me call it g of t0 and y0. So t0 and y0 are the initial time and the initial condition. And this function is given by the sum of two terms. So there is a first term, which is the gain, that is actually just a function of, of the final state, uh, the state at time uh, capital T uh, of your system that I will uh, write in a minute. And then you have some, so this is the gain that you want to maximize. And you have also some cost, which contributes to this uh, objective function, which is the integral from the initial time to uh, the final time of your inventory uh, to, the, uh, to the power two. So this is something that penalizes you whenever you still have uh, the quantity of, of, of your good uh, to sell and you have not yet uh, sold uh, all of it. So this will be a cost associated to the fact that you have uh, still a finite inventory uh, at any time uh, s here. And uh, how do we write the uh, gain? Well, so again, this is an example uh, of, uh, of a model uh, that we take here. And uh, in here, we choose the gain to be, uh, to be what? Well, you have the final wealth uh, that you get by selling your quantity at the final time, uh, capital T, that of course you want to maximize. And then if you are left with uh, some amount of this quantity that you have not yet sold, then uh, there is some value associated to it that in principle would be the product, so the amount of this quantity times the price at that particular uh, final time. But again, you may have, uh, or it is realistic to assume that the price is not really, so a little bit similarly to what you have in here, uh, the final price is somehow diminished by the fact that uh, maybe you want to liquidate at finite time t, so you really want to sell whatever you're left with uh, at the final time. And when you want to sell it so fast at the end, there might be a, a penalty, so let's say a cost, uh, an execution price, this is how it is called, uh, associated with this uh, selling at the final time, which again diminishes the, uh, the effective price. Uh, at the time, uh, capital T. Okay, so what we are going to do is to try to look at this uh, example and derive uh, some Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation for uh, this particular model. And before, so let me check that you see. Okay. And so let's start with the first part. And before, let me just make a comment to this part one. So the first point is, is just a comment if you want to, uh, if, uh, what we can do is to look a little bit at the model and try to figure out how many parameters we have, which are uh, quite many. So we have two parameters which enter into the equation for the price, which are theta that measures uh, somehow the strength of this uh, market impact. And we have the variance sigma associated to the noise. And then you have three other parameters. So this uh, kappa here in the equation for uh, the wealth. And uh, what else? We have the phi in the, in, the, in the cost function there. And we have uh, capital A, which controls uh, somehow the cost associated to selling uh, everything at the final time. And uh, what I just want to point out, so we will go back to uh, analyzing a little bit the effects of these parameters uh, once we have the solution to the problem, but I just want to uh, pause a moment to, to figure out uh, what should be the effect of all of these parameters, in particular of the last three. And the idea is that more or less the parameters phi and the uh, parameter capital A are uh, quantities that uh, somehow want you or push you to sell faster uh, in a way, right? Uh, because phi is associated to the 
uh, cost that you pay at any time by having a finite uh, inventory. So uh, it's due to the fact that you have not sold uh, everything at that time. And so there is a cost uh, associated to it. So when this phi is large, you expect that you want to choose a velocity that is uh, somehow fast enough so that you sell uh, all of this uh, quantity fast enough. And more or less the same role is played by this uh, capital A in here. Uh, whereas K, as you see here, penalizes uh, those choices in which you uh, sell very, very fast, because if you sell very, very fast, you are diminishing the effective price uh, for your good, and therefore you are diminishing the total wealth uh, that you're making. So this is just to point out that phi A and K are uh, a little bit in competition. So this would want you to sell fast. And this would want you to sell not so fast, let's say. So the problem is not uh, totally trivial. OK, so uh, having said this, what we can do now is to uh, try to derive a uh, hamilton jacobi bellman equation uh, along the same lines okay, uh, of uh, lecture four. So now, but why is it cut my video? Okay. Okay, so let try to derive this hamilton jacobi bellman equation. So to do this, I will introduce, uh, let's say, just for notation, let me call small y uh, a particular value for the vector for the random variable uh, capital Y there. So this will be the vector given by uh, small q, small x, and small s. So uh, these are my state variables. And let me introduce, as uh, it was done in lecture four, uh, the so-called cost to go. Okay, which is a function v of time and of a particular configuration of uh, of my system at time t. And in general, so what we are going to do in this first part, as I said, is to work at fixed. Uh, value of this function m of, m of t, mu of t. So we are not assuming that this comes from interaction, but just that somebody gives you uh, this function and then you try to solve uh, the optimization problems for this uh, dynamical system. So this is why uh, there will always be a dependence on this uh, fixed function mu of t in whatever I'm going to do uh, in this first part. And uh, what is the definition of this cost to go? Well, this is the soup over the velocity uh, t. Uh, at any later time of the expectation value of my uh, cost function up there from, uh, so as you see in the way that I wrote, so this is an expectation value over the noise, it's an average over the noise. And I wrote uh, the cost function. So in principle, as I say, uh, this is a function of the whole, uh, let's say trajectory for your vector y at any time. But I'm indicating in here only the dependence on the initial condition. So this is the cost that you get starting at time t0 from a given configuration, uh, let's say y0. And uh, therefore, what I have in here is, uh, is the following. So I assume uh, that I have some time t uh, that is larger than 0 but smaller than uh, capital T. And I assume that I know uh, what is the optimal strategy to follow from that uh, time t uh, onwards, and this defines uh, precisely my uh, my cost to go. So just to repeat a little bit the sketch of the lecture, the idea is as follows. So you have time, you have your final time, capital T, and then you assume that you know how to solve the problem at any time, so this is zero, at any time late, uh, larger than this uh, t here. So in this region, you assume that you know what is the optimal strategy to follow, so what is the cost to go, and you know this for any possible initial value at time uh, small t. So in, in the lecture, of course, the problem was formulated in terms of a one-dimensional uh, function. Here we have a vector, so let me draw it like this. 
So of course, uh, this is higher dimensional, but the idea is that uh, whatever is the particular value of the vector y at time t, you know what you have to do uh, from time t onwards. So you know what is the velocity that optimizes, uh, that gives you the optimal strategy uh, up to the final time. And uh, the question is, once I know this uh, for any particular initial point at time t, uh, can I uh, derive an equation that tells me what I should do in uh, the little time interval, which is between t minus dt and, uh, and time t? And the idea is that to choose uh, the optimal strategy in this little time interval, I have to uh, usually, uh, if you remember from the lecture, I always have to compensate uh, between two things. So first of all, I told you that we know how to solve the problem for larger times. So we know the value of the cost to go for any particular choice of y. And therefore, for instance, we know what is the best point where to start from that would optimize uh, our gain uh, at the final time t. But then we assume that at time t minus dt, we are in some particular initial condition, some particular point. And it might be very costly to go uh, from that particular point to the initial condition at time t, which optimizes your, uh, your total gain, because there is some cost associated, for instance, to moving much into this uh, small interval dt. So you always have to compensate between the extra cost associated to this uh, movement in this small step and the gain that you would have uh, from the final point that you reach uh, with this movement up to the final time. And this is what gives you uh, an optimization uh, equation which is, uh, which is not totally trivial. So let's see this. Uh, and uh, just a remark, so in the, uh, in the lecture, the cost which was associated to this uh, small step was essentially uh, due to the elastic term. In here, things will be a little bit different, but uh, let me uh, show this concretely. Okay, so to derive this uh, Hamilton uh, Jacobi Bellman, I will do uh, introduce just for the sake of notation. So I will introduce, uh, I will call the velocity in this, at this time, t minus dt, which is what we want to optimize uh, over. I will just call it u to simplify the notation. And then I will assume, and I will call the noise in this interval t minus dt simply by eta. I'm sorry, and then we will, cannot see what yes. you're writing. Uh, we can ah, see what you're writing. You're right, but I don't know why. Okay, wait. Ah, now I see because I'm not moving the camera. Okay. Now you see it. Yes. Okay. So I was just introducing, uh, I mean, I just want to drop this dependence on uh, t minus dt. And I will assume that uh, if I start at a point y, so let me write it like this. So if I am at a point y at time t minus dt, at time t, I will be at a given point y plus dy. And this dy will depend on what? Well, it will depend both on the velocities that I choose in this small interval dt, and, uh, and it will also depend on the noise uh, in this small interval dt. And so I will try to solve an optimization problem for this velocity in the interval dt, averaging over the noise in this small interval dt. So I'm just repeating what was uh, done in the lecture. And so to derive this uh, equation, what do we have to do? So does it fit in here? So what I can do is to uh, try to write an expression for the cost to go at the previous time t minus dt. So v at t minus dt, assuming that I am at the point y at t minus dt. So y is a variable, so I will use it uh, uh, here I use it uh, for time t, but now let me assume that uh, y identifies my position at the previous time. And let me drop the dependence on mu t uh, in the following. 
So what would be uh, this equal to? Well, exactly as uh, we had in the lecture. So as I said, I want to optimize over my velocity in the little interval, U, the uh, total cost. So the total cost will have two contributions. There is one contribution that comes from the extra cost associated to this uh, small step that I'm doing. And this is proportional to this integral in here. That's given that the time interval is, is very small, I can approximate as minus phi q squared dt, where q is one of the components of this uh, vector y, the first one. And then the remaining cost is encoded in, uh, in the function that I assume that I already know. So it is encoded in the cost to go from time t, except that I have to compute this cost to go at the point that I reach starting from point y at the previous time and applying the given velocity u. So what this means is that in here, I will have my function v at time t, but computed at y plus dy. And y plus dy is, is noisy. So it depends, as I said, both on this small u that I'm optimizing over, but it also depends on the noise which acts in the small interval. So what I have to do is to average uh, that uh, function there with respect to this uh, noise in the small time interval. OK. And now, exactly as we did in the lecture, the, the, the way to proceed is to uh, give an expansion, a Taylor expansion for this uh, function in here, and then average over the noise. So let me do it in here. What do you see? So we need this, which I think you still see. Okay. Now I have to shift a little bit. Okay. So let's try to expand. And we want to expand to linear order in dt. So this is v of y plus dy. Uh, and in order to, uh, to do the expansion, we should remember what are the equations. So remember that y is the vector of all our three variables, which satisfy some equations, which I just erased. But uh, you have them written. So let me do this uh, Taylor expansion here. So uh, the first term will be just v of dy, of course. And then I have a term which is the partial derivative of my function v with respect to the first, uh, sorry, I forgot the dt. I hope that you see it. There is a small dt in here. Plus dv over dq. And here I would like to put uh, q dot times dt, right? So the derivative of q over time times uh, the dt. And the derivative of q over time, we have it from the equation. So this is just given by u times dt, where u is the velocity in the small interval dt. Then we have to take the derivative with respect to the variable x times uh, x dot, if you want. So the time derivative of x. And this was minus the velocity times the price plus KU. OK. And then there is the derivative with respect to S, so dV over dS, and uh, the equation for S dot. So sorry, I keep forgetting the dt. There is always a dt. So the equation for S dot was what? So there was the uh, theta term, mu of t uh, times dt. Let me put it at the end. So there was theta mu of t uh, this one, you're right. Sorry. 
exactly. Thanks. So here we had theta, mu, and then there was a noise term. So let me write it like this. So that was sigma times eta of p uh, dt. And so let me put the dt in here. OK. I'm becoming messy, sorry. Um, and here we have, so remember, uh, this is white noise. I, I didn't specify it, but I'm assuming that this is white noise. So remember what we discussed uh, last, last time, namely that this noise in the, in the limit of a correlation function, which goes to a delta function, is of the order of 1 over square root of dt. And therefore, the product eta of t times dt is of the order of square root of dt. And this tells us that if we want uh, all of the contributions which are of order dt, we also need to uh, take the term which comes from the square of this uh, factor in here. And this will come with the second derivative uh, of v with respect to the variable s, right? Because then this will be multiplied essentially by uh, the, the square of this uh, equation of motion for s. And let me just keep the contribution that is of order dt, which is of the form so let me write it like this, eta squared times dt squared plus higher order terms that we will neglect uh, when deriving the, uh, when going to the continuous limit. So now what I do is I take the average of this expression with respect to the noise eta, okay, both of the left and the right hand side. So this was what I called eta before. It's the noise which acts in the little time intervals. And you see that once I take the average, so this is independent, this is independent, this is independent, the average of this uh, is equal to zero because the noise has uh, zero average. Whereas the average of this quantity in here is uh, precisely equal to dt. So it will give me the, uh, the contribution that I'm looking for to, uh, to linear order in dt. So this is exactly as, uh, as it was in the lecture. And once I have this, what shall I do? Well, uh, what I can do is to, um, where is it? To go back to the expression in there and substitute uh, to the right hand side what I just derived. So what I'm left with is v of t minus dt why? Let me bring this to the other side so that I have minus v of ty. And then on the right hand side, I have the soup over u of the first term, which is untouched. So now I have c q squared. And the dt, I will uh, collect it uh, at the end. Actually, let me divide everything by dt directly. So these terms come from uh, the cost uh, in the leader interval dt, and then I have to plug my expansion. So I have dv over dq times u minus dv over dx u s plus ku. Okay, and then I have dv over ds theta mu of t plus sigma square over two, d square of v, so the contribution of the noise. And that's it, okay. And of course, if, you, if I now take the limit of uh, dt going to, uh, to zero, what I get in the left hand side is uh, nothing but minus the time derivative of my cost to go with respect to t. Okay, so this is our uh, form for today of the uh, Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation, which is an equation where your time derivative has uh, the minus sign uh, in front, as you remember from the lecture, and where, so this is no longer as we are used to, we are used to initial value problems where we specify the value of the function at time zero and then we want to solve uh, forward in times. Whereas what we have in here is more a boundary value problem where we specify the value of the function at time capital T, and then we want to solve backward 
in time and get the solution at time zero. So what is the boundary uh, value? What is the value of the function at capital T? Well, this we know it from uh, the expression for the, uh, for the function G that unfortunately I erased. But if you remember the function G had a cost which was associated precisely to the value of this function at the final time, plus, uh, sorry, as a gain, which is associated to that, plus a cost, and the cost is an integral which goes from uh, T up to capital T, so the integral vanishes when I compute it at, uh, at the lower edge equal to capital T. So this is just to say that the boundary value in here is just uh, given by X uh, plus Q S minus AQ. Which is the value of the function g uh, evaluated at a vector y. So this is the boundary condition. Okay. And now what we have to do is to try to solve uh, this equation for uh, the cost to go uh, v. And we try to do this, and I don't remember if this is still point two. Probably yes. Um, yes, so we try to do it uh, with an ansatz. So we, we just um, try to, get, to, to, to guess a little bit what is the shape of this function v at any time. And the guess comes uh, from the structure that you see at the final time. So as you see, the, your boundary condition is of the form x plus qx minus a q square so what we can assume or try to guess this is an answer is that at any time t our function v has in some sense this structure so there is this linear term plus some generic function of q so we do the following answer which as we see we will see we'll simplify the calculation and now i hope that you see it so we assume that our v of t y can be written as x plus qs plus some generic function of time and only of q that I call omega of t q. And uh, this answer is good because it allows us, as, as I will show in a minute, to reformulate the problem as uh, more or less uh, a problem in terms of, uh, of q. Okay, so let's see this, uh, how this works. So what I have to do is just to replace these answers into my equation and see how things simplify a bit. Okay. This is just algebra. So on the left hand side, I will just have minus the derivative of this omega function with respect to time, which is the only thing that depends on time. And on the right, well, I have terms which do not depend on the velocity u, so let me write them separately. So there is this phi, then there is uh, the theta term, dv over ds, theta u of t, and perhaps already in here, so you see if we make this answer, the only dependence on s is linear, so dv over ds gives me just a factor of q, so let me write it here, okay. Plus, there should be another term up there which does not depend on u, that is this second derivative, but because we are making this answer uh, which is linear, we see that the second derivative vanishes, so I don't have any contribution in this particular example, which is proportional to, uh, to sigma square. And let me comment about this uh, in a minute. But before, let's write what remains. So what remains is the soup over u of what? Of u times the derivative with respect to q that gives me s plus uh, the derivative of w with respect to q. So I have a factor of u, dw over dq. And then I will have a factor of u times s, but the factor of u times x cancels with the contribution 
the first contribution from the derivative over uh, x, which is simply equal to one. So you, you see that the factor u times s will cancel, and what I'm left with in here is minus k u square, and that's it. Okay. So our equation is now quite uh, simple or simpler, and we can uh, directly solve for uh, the optimal value of u. So if we maximize this quadratic function, what we get out of this is that u optimal will just be given by 1 over 2k times d omega over dq. And if we now substitute this value of u optimal into this expression, we see that the contribution in here is just 1 over 4k times d omega over dq to the power 2, hopefully. Yes. OK, and this is the final form within our ansatz of uh, the hamilton jacobi bellman equation. And uh, let me add uh, two comments, which are actually point three of the exercise, I think. So the first uh, comment is that uh, this equation is a little bit different with respect to the one that was given in the lecture. And the difference is that there is no diffusion term. So the diffusion term would correspond in here to a second derivative of uh, our function uh, omega. And here, the second derivative disappears because, so in general, the second derivative comes from the noise, so from higher order contributions uh, due to the noise, as we saw in here. And we are killing uh, this contribution in here because the noise is only coupled to the price variable, and we are making an answer which is linear in the price variables. So in this particular example, what we find is that our optimal strategy, which will be the velocity, does not depend on what people call in, in the economics language the volatility, so the fluctuations of, uh, of the price. So at least one among the many parameters that we have simplifies uh, once we make uh, and goes away once uh, we do these answers. And the second comment is that there is no diffusion term. So this is an equation which is uh, nonlinear because you have a derivative square, but which is uh, first order in the derivative. So there is no diffusion term. So it's a little bit simpler with respect to the one uh, given in the lecture, and indeed, we can solve uh, for, uh, for it explicitly, as I will show uh, right now. OK. So now what we can do is try to solve directly for this function omega of q. And this is a calculation that can be done explicitly. I will not do all of the steps, but I will just highlight some things which are perhaps more interesting. And so the first thing that helps you when you try to solve it is again, so what we can do is try to so if you look at the structure of the equation, I don't know if this is still visible. Yes. So what one can do in general is try to uh, write down, so you have a, a, a function which depends on two parameters, times and q. You can try to write down some, uh, let's say, power expansion in your variable q, okay, which in general has some coefficients that will depend on time, and then you have q to the n. So this is an answer, again, that you can make in general. But now, if you look at the structure of our equations, you realize that uh, things are actually very simple. So you can truncate uh, this expansion, and uh, you will get only a few coefficients that you have to solve for. And the reason is that, so you see on the right-hand side, I have only 
terms which depend and at most on q squared and then i have the derivative of this function with respect to q to the power two and so you see that if i truncate this expansion to the power q square what i get on the right hand side are only terms which are at most of order q square and on the right hand side i will always have uh, terms which are at most of the order uh, at which i truncate and so i can close the equation just uh, stopping to uh, let's say n equal to so what this means is that I will write this in the following form. So there will be an H0 of T plus H1 of T Q. And then just for simplicity, let me uh, put a minus uh, in front of the quadratic term Q square. And this is enough. So if I plug now uh, this expression into my equations, so you see on the left hand side, I will have just the derivatives of the coefficient with respect to time. On the right hand side, I will have several terms, and then I can equate all of the terms which correspond to the same powers uh, of Q. And if I do this, I will get equations for these uh, coefficients uh, depending on T. So I'll give you just the form of the resulting equation. This is easy to, uh, to derive. So the equation for H0 is of the following form. The derivative of h0 will be equal to minus h1 of t over 2k. Then I have the equation for h1, which is minus theta times this function mu of t plus 1 over 2k h1 of t h2 of t. This comes from the square on the right hand side, if you do the calculation. And then I have the third equation for H2, which is minus 2 phi plus 1 over 2k H2 square, uh, depending on P. OK, so this is a system of equation. Now, of course, I also had a boundary uh, term which gives me conditions for uh, these functions at the time uh, capital T so remember that uh, due to our answer omega of capital T Q will be simply equal to minus a Q square if you go back to the equations that we wrote before and so this means that at time capital T H0 and H1 will be equal to zero, whereas H2 is equal to minus 2A. No, plus 2A, because I have a minus here. OK. And now, given this, what one has to do is to solve uh, somehow this system of equations for the coefficients. So what I want to do uh, in the next uh, half an hour, maybe, are just two things. So the first thing is that if you look at the structure of this equation, you see that equation three uh, is closed in the sense that it only depends on H2. So we can solve it uh, directly. And I just want to show how to solve this equation via separation of variables, because this is something that comes up, uh, came up several times in the lecture. So we can just do this exercise uh, once uh, together in here. And then what you would have to do is to solve for H0 and H1. And these are two coupled equations where the variables appear uh, in both of them. And most importantly, you have now this function mu of t. So, so far we said, okay, let's assume that mu of t is a fixed function. And we try to look uh, for a solution at fixed value of mu of t. But now you see that to solve this, uh, this system of equations, it would be nice to specify uh, what is this function mu of t? And this uh, brings us to this idea of uh, interacting systems and mean field games. So I will give uh, the idea for that and then uh, perhaps uh, leave uh, most of the calculations to, uh, to you as an exercise. OK, so this is the plan. So let's start by solving equation three. So this is a parenthesis, if you want, um, just to discuss uh, together this idea of separation of variables, which 
comes up when you want to solve for the stationary state of Fokker-Planck, for instance. And it was also given, I think, today in the lecture uh, several times. So let's uh, do a uh, detour or example, actually. Okay, you still see, but better to do this. Okay, so the idea is as follows. We have a differential equation on the left-hand side. You have dH2 over dt. So let's rewrite it in differential form. So I can write that dH2 is equal to what I have on the right-hand side. So minus 2 phi plus h2 square over 2k times dt. And actually, let me bring out a factor of 2k. And so here I have minus 4k5. OK. And now you see that I have here a product of something which depends only on h2 times uh, the differential in dt. So what I can do is to bring this product to the other side and get uh, to the other side so that I get a left hand side which depends only on h2. So this is h2 square minus 4 k phi. And the right hand side depends only on t through the dt. Okay. And once I have this, what can I do? Well, I can integrate both sides. So I integrate the right hand side with respect to t from a given time t0 up to a time, uh, well, t in general. And the left hand side, I integrate it uh, with respect to the corresponding value or between the corresponding value of the function h2. So from h2 of t0 to h2 of t. So I hope you see it, maybe it's small. OK. Now, what is the right hand side? Well, uh, OK, let me first do the left hand side. So the left hand side is an integral that I know how to do. So it's an arcotangent hyperbolic. This you can check. Uh, OK, we'll need the equation again. but. Never mind. So you can check that the following holds that the integral in dx of x square minus a, where a is some positive constant, so for a larger than zero, this is given by minus one over square root of a times. the hyperbolic, the inverse of the hyperbolic tangent evaluated at x divided by square root of a. So this is just an example. It allows me to compute uh, the left hand side. So in particular, it tells me that the hyperbolic arctan of my function h2 of t divided by square root of or kc, which is what plays the role of a, is equal to minus, and now let me do it correctly, I think there is a phi over k t plus t. So c is a constant which incorporates, uh, if you want, t0. And also what you would get, so what you would get from the left hand side is the value of the integrand. Uh, sorry, of the integral at h2 minus the value at h2 of t0, which is a constant. So I can absorb everything into this constant t. And what I get out of this equation is that by inverting the hyperbolic arctan, I will get that this is uh, simply given by square root of 4k phi. So I go a little bit fast, but that's just because it's it's not so relevant just to give you an idea, phi over kt plus my constant c uh, that is now 
uh, no, it's the same constant. Okay. And once I have this, how do I fix C? Well, remember that we had an information about the boundary value of this function. So we know that H2 at time capital T has to be equal to 2 times A. And therefore, what I have to do is to compute this quantity at capital time T and then solve for C. And I will get an expression for C, which depends on uh, on capital A. OK, so in particular, you get that C is square root of C over K times capital T plus arctanash A over square root of K phi. OK, so this you can check uh, afterwards. It is just uh, algebra. And this gives you the solution for the coefficient H2. And somehow the only thing that I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to do is to discuss an example for this uh, separation of variables, which, as I said, uh, comes up several times uh, in this type of problems. OK, now we have H2. And so we have solved the equation 3 here. So now let's go to uh, this problem of trying to solve equation 1 and equation 2 uh, for one particular choice of mu of t, which comes from the interactions. And this is part two of the exercise. It's a square, yes. So the question, the remark is that there is a square in here. Thanks that I forgot. People see it. I hope so. OK. Now let's go to part two. And let's try to be a bit more precise about uh, the idea that I sketched before that now we want to choose uh, this mu of t to be somehow the average of all of the velocities of uh, all of the other investors which are uh, in the market. And uh, we want to do it uh, with a reasoning that is very close to mean field. So this is, let me summarize the point of, uh, of point five of the exercise. And uh, the idea is the following. So suppose that now we have many investors, OK, labeled by, uh, as I say, by A. So you will have this vector A, uh, which labels my investors. You will have a solution for the optimal velocity uh, for each of these investors. And you want to define mu as an average over all of the others. Uh, velocities uh, that you get from the corresponding equation. So how do you do this in a mean field scheme? Well, let me sketch it uh, very briefly. So the idea is that you start by choosing one representative agent. Let me label her by A. Uh, one specific value of A. So this is a little bit like when you do easing mean field, you choose one site that you assume to be representative of all of the sites. And then once you have chosen this agent, you assume that you know uh, that you know this mu of t that is given by the behavior of all of the other agents. So in some sense, you know, you assume that you know what all of the other agents are doing, and you solve the problem for your representative agent given this uh, particular value of mu of t, which is uh, precisely what we did in part one. So if you do this, you get the result that we get. So you get that the optimal velocity now for our particular agent A at given value of mu t we can write it as 1 over 2k, the derivative of this function omega with respect to q. And this is a function of t, q, at the given mu t. So you assume you know what everybody else is doing. You use this information to solve for the velocity of your particular agent. So if you want, thinking about easing, 
you assume that you know the magnetization of all of the other sites. This tells you what is the effective field which acts on the particular site that you are looking at. You solve for the magnetization of that particular site at fixed value of the field, and then you have to impose self-consistency. And so this is the step which is missing here, that is impose uh, self-consistency, meaning that uh, the result that you get is consistent with your assumption on mu, uh, namely with the assumption that mu is the average of these velocities. So let me write it down and then I will specify it. So the self-consistent equation in this setting will correspond to saying that mu of t is what? Is an average over, if you want, all of the representative sites of the solution for this particular site that you get, uh, that you got at fixed value of mu t. So you see that this is, uh, I hope you see it. Now I will tell you what I mean precisely by this average. But uh, before let me stress, so this is really a self-consistent equation. So it is an equation in which it's an equation for mu of t, in which mu of t depends, appears on both sides. Sorry, yes. You were a bit out of our screen. Ah, uh, yes, you're right. Usual problem. Thanks a lot, guys, for. Okay. So you have mu of t both on the right and then on the uh, left hand side, and you have to solve for this function mu of t, knowing what is the velocity at fixed uh, profile for mu of t. So uh, let me tell you how should we intend this average with respect to all of the other agents. So the way we can interpret it is as follows. Uh, now I can write here, yes. So what is the average? Well, to make this average precise, we can think in the following way. So as I said, we have many, many agents, and all of those have a particular initial value of their uh, inventory, Q0 labeled by uh, by the agents and uh, these initial values we may assume that they are distributed so that there is a probability uh, p0 of uh, of this distribution of initial uh, values for the inventors inventories so of what you want to sell or buy and then we know that uh, each of these agents has its own velocity that determines the time evolution of this uh, quantity Q. So if you look at uh, the differential equation for Q and you integrate it, then you know that QT of A is Q0 of A plus the integral from T0 to T in dS of your velocity dS of A, which depends, as we saw solving the optimal problem, it depends on your trajectory and in general on mu t times pt that I'm uh, integrating over uh, in here. Okay, so this is the optimal solution. And then you see that if I have a distribution for the initial value, the initial value uh, of, of my inventory will determine. Uh, what is uh, the optimal solution together with all the other parameters. And this equation will tell me that I will have also a distribution at any time t. So if this is a random variable, q at any time will be itself a random variable with a given distribution, pt of qt. And so in some sense, when I say that we want to average over uh, all of these, the investors, so what I mean with this uh, average, that again, you don't see, with this averaging here is essentially an average with respect to 
uh, to the state of the system at any time, assuming that we have a given distribution of, uh, of the initial uh, inventory uh, for all of our agents. Okay, so this is how we should interpret the self-consistent equation. And now let's see just very briefly um, how to finish and solve, or at least let me sketch uh, how the solution uh, can be obtained for this system of equations. So let me start from here. So to, to go on, uh, we now need essentially another equation for this uh, mu of t to solve uh, our system of equations. And it is convenient to introduce the quantity that I call E of t, which is the average in the sense that I just described of uh, Q of t. So it's just the average with respect to this uh, distribution. And why is this uh, nice to introduce? Well, the idea is that if I take the derivative of this average, so let me say, uh, what is this average? So let's look at this equation in here and take the average. So if I do this, this will tell me that I get a factor which is the average at time zero. And then I have the integral. I bring the average inside the integral. So now t0, I'm assuming it to be zero. And I will have the integral over ds of the average of all my velocities, optimal velocity, which depends on qs and on mu. OK. And this average is precisely what I define as uh, to be equal to mu of t through my self-consistent equation. So this means that if I take the time derivative of this quantity that I just introduced, this so the time derivative of the constant is zero, and the time derivative will just uh, give me the integrand. So it will give me the average of my velocity at time t given mu of t that, through the self-consistent equation that I want to impose, is just equal to mu of t. So if I solve for this quantity e, taking the derivative, I have uh, this function mu of t, which is what appears in my system of equation. So now to complete the system of equation, we just have to derive uh, an equation for this uh, E of t in here. OK. And before, yeah. And then we are almost done. Okay. So once I am here, let me also, or let's say once I am here, let me look at this equation that I just wrote and remember that I know the solution for the optimal uh, velocity at fixed uh, value of mu of t. So I found before that vt, so here there should be an opt, uh, a subscript that tells me that I am computing this. Uh, at the solution of uh, for uh, for the optimization problem, so let me write it here. The opt as a function of q and for a given mu of t was just given by one over two k the derivative of the function omega that I introduced to the power two. And using the ansatz uh, for the function omega, this is uh, just 1 over 2k times, so the derivative of omega is h1 of t minus h2 of t, uh, the two cancels with the 1 half q to the power 2. You see it, OK. Here I'm just using the ansatz. Uh, that I made for the expansion of omega. And therefore, if I now plug this expression into this equation for E prime, I get a fourth equation that I call equation four, which tells me that E prime of t 
is also equal to the expectation value of this quantity here with respect to Q. So now I'm, uh, I'm let me write small Q. So this is a solution for any possible value of small Q. Now, if I compute the optimal trajectory at a fixed, uh, the optimal velocity at a fixed trajectory for my uh, random variable Q, and I take the expectation value, what I will get, so this is just from here, I will get that this is one over two K. There is no square here, right? Sorry. Okay. H1 of T minus H2 of T times the expectation value of Q, which is nothing but E of T itself. So from all, using all of these identities and my solution for V at six mu, I get this fourth equation that allows me to relate the quantity that I just introduced to H1 and H2, for which I have the two other equations up there. And so now what's the strategy to solve uh, this system of equations? I will just sketch it. So the first thing that you can do is uh, you take another derivative with respect to time of equation four. So now I want to close, to get a closed equation for E of T. So what I can do is I take the second derivative of my equation four with respect to time. And what I have is one over two K H1 prime with respect to T minus H2 of T prime. This is not a problem because we solved the problem for H2. So we know what is the explicit form of this uh, derivative times E minus one over two K H2 of T times E prime of T. Okay, so now we have H2, H2 that as I said, we know we have E that is what we want and we have this H1 uh, prime that, uh, that the, the say depends indirectly on, uh, on the function E. Why? Because if you look at the equation two, this gives you precisely H1 prime as minus theta mu and mu is what? Mu is E prime of T plus one over two K H1 H2. So you will see that this factor, if, if I now replace, I place equation two in here, okay. What I see is that, and I use that mu of T is E prime of T, I will get out of this, so this you can check. I will cancel terms like this, I think, and I will get a second order equation for E, which is of the following form. So I'm going a bit fast in here, but just because this is just algebra. So I have H2 prime of T minus H2 square of T over 2K equal to zero. Okay, so this is what you should get. And the quantity in parentheses, you can further simplify it by using equation three. So you know that this uh, will be equal to minus uh, two phi. Okay. So this quantity in parentheses, well, okay. You see it. So the quantity in parentheses here is minus two phi. So now you have a simple uh, second order differential equation for E. And you can solve it. So you know that when you have equations of this form, the solution is always given by linear combinations of exponentials. So again, I will just give you the general form and then you can fill in the details. So the equation, as we say, is 2K second derivative of T plus theta E prime of T. And then we have minus two phi E of T equal to zero. And if you do all of the calculation, you will find that you can write 
the solution. So Y will be an exponential? Well, okay, because this is a linear equation in the derivatives. So if you make an ansatz which is of the exponential form, E to the alpha T, you will uh, be able to rewrite this as an equation for the coefficient alpha. And by solving these equations, you find that you can write it as uh, in the following form. Or what you can do is you take this answer, you plug it into the equation, and this gives you uh, a second order equation for these uh, omegas that uh, is of the following form, so we'll, which will depend on the parameters you see in this equation, so phi, k, and uh, theta. And if you do it, you will find this dependence in here. OK. So the equation will allow you to fix uh, the values of omega plus and omega minus, and then you see you have an extra constant C, and uh, you have to fix it knowing the boundary value for, uh, for, uh, for your uh, quantity E that you can deduce, for example, uh, from, uh, you can deduce it from the boundary values of uh, H1 and, uh, and H2 uh, that you have uh, from before. Okay, so uh, I don't want to, to uh, now do all of the details uh, of the solution of the system of equations because we also do not have time, but what is the idea? So the idea is that through this game of introducing E of T and solving for E of T, uh, you now have everything uh, that you need to go back to uh, what I called before equation one, two, and three. So equation three we solved, equation uh, one, or if you want, just look at, it in this form here. So from here, you know that if you know H2 and you know E of T and its derivative, then you can solve for H1. And if you know H1, you can solve for uh, the equation of for H0, which was just that the derivative of H0 is minus H1 square over 2K. And so you have solved uh, all of your equations. And what you can do, and this is a little bit an exercise for you, is to try to write them down, uh, this equation, and try to plot them as a function of the various parameters of the problems that, uh, that we have. And uh, of course, I'm not going to do it uh, at the blackboard, but I just want to make perhaps one final comment that is related to part three. So part three are just questions uh, about the dependence on the parameters. So I will just make two comments. So let me keep omega in here. Or maybe one comment. So one comment is uh, the following. So let's go back to equation four up there, which you see. Yes. So equation four. OK, so let me conclude with a final comment, which is one of the questions in point seven. Okay. So equation four is of the form. Uh, so you see that you have uh, E prime and uh, E, but let me maybe just take uh, let me look at the line which is above uh, equation four, which gives me the um, the optimal velocity. So uh, the idea is the following. So I can write that the optimal velocity, which is e prime of t, because of the self-consistent equation, is given uh, by what? So it is in principle given. No, sorry, this I can write in the following way. Okay. And where does it come from? Well, it comes from essentially this. 
So I have this equation up here, and then I can rewrite uh, H1 as a function of E. And if I rewrite H1 as a function of E by solving equation four for H1, I get this expression for, uh, for the optimal velocity. And it is useful to write it in, in this way, just uh, to tell you the final comment. And the final comment is that you have two contributions to the uh, optimal velocity. So you have one contribution that goes like uh, E prime T. And remember that E prime T is what we call mu of T. So it is an average of all of the velocities of the other players uh, in the game. So what this is telling you is something that uh, people in this literature uh, call follow the trading flow. So this is a term that is basically telling you that if everybody is selling uh, very fast, each of the other agents will have a velocity that is large and negative. And so your E prime contribution in here will be the average of all of these velocities that will be large and negative. And so you also want to have a velocity that is large and negative. So you want to match with what uh, all of the other people are doing uh, on average. And this is what uh, people in the literature call uh, indeed following the flow. With an extra uh, contribution though, which comes from, uh, from this difference in here, and this difference in here, it tells you, so typically you can show that this quantity is positive. And therefore, it's telling you that, yes, you may have a large negative contribution uh, from the, the, the flow of the other people. Uh, but then you can compensate a little bit this, uh, this trend by this term. And this term is proportional to, uh, let's say, Q, so the amount of uh, inventory that you still have at the given time t. Uh, and E of T is what is the average of this uh, of the inventory of all of the other traders. So what this is telling you is that if you have an amount of inventory that is smaller than the average, so you have already so sold more than what the average uh, has sold, then you get a contribution which is positive, which compensates a little bit uh, the negative contribution of the velocities of all of the others. So you somehow have to adjust to uh, what the average is doing, and this is the essence of uh, mean field, meaning that if everybody's selling fast, you want to sell as they are to satisfy also the self-consistent equation. And at the same time, you want that your average inventory matches somehow the average for all the others. So if at the time you have an inventory which is smaller, you slow down a little bit your selling so as to compensate and uh, somehow uh, be consistent with uh, with what the system is doing on average. So this is uh, slow down if Q is smaller than uh, than the average uh, at the given time t. Okay, so that's basically uh, what uh, what I wanted to say. And uh, the other comments that you find in section three are again about analyzing a little bit uh, the structure of the solution that you uh, see in particular, as you see, um, well, okay, you can go through it uh, by yourself. One observation that you can make is that in the behavior of E of T, uh, you see that the parameters enter in here, like theta k and phi, but the parameter A, which was uh, related to the cost uh, of liquidation at the final time doesn't enter in here. So this tells you that maybe you can uh, somehow, uh, to this level, you can forget about that extra parameter and what you can really play with uh, to get to different strategies are uh, the three ones that appear uh, in here. But this you can uh, check by yourself. And okay, I think this is enough. And for the Fokker-Planck, that's really very fast, but maybe we do it uh, next time. So there is the next today. Today number five is, um, or, or there are two weeks uh, that I allocated for the same today, and that is just to have a little bit of pause to also catch up with what uh, was left behind. And I think that is next week and, uh, and the following one uh, after the holidays. So this is to say that we will have time to, uh, to discuss Fokker Planck again. And for the moment, we can stop here, I think. So are there questions? 
Nope. Okay. Okay, then I stop the recording.